Hi, just as I was about to start this video, Milo popped himself into my lap and he doesn't seem to want to move. I think that's because it's about dinner time. So hopefully this video won't take very long and Milo will get his dinner when he actually wants it. So um, let's get started. The purpose of this video is to talk about how to take up the genre of a personal essay. Remember, every genre, every style of writing has specific characteristics, specific patterns, and they're unique to this genre. So you can't write a college essay, which is very straightforward, an introduction with a thesis, a few main points, everyone has a topic sentence, some kind of evidence, analysis, and then you sum it all up at the end. No, this is different. This feels organic. It almost feels like there isn't a pattern. And you need to find the pattern so you can communicate in a way that engages an audience, gets them to ask the questions you're asking along with you, and almost organically, you show them the answer for you, but you want to make them think. You want your readers to think along with you and maybe adopt your point of view. So how do you, in order to learn how to use a genre that you're unfamiliar with, you need to expose yourself to it. And so I've put a ton of examples of this genre into the week two module. And hopefully you've read a lot of them and you've chosen a few that you feel a little comfortable with. You like their tone, you think that tone might be good for your topic. Um, so as you're reading, as you are reading, I hope it let you let that trigger topics and questions so that you could choose one that would be a mentor text for you. You've got to know what these feel like, how they work, what are their characteristics. And then you've got to think and you've got to write and you've got to brainstorm because the goal is to ask a question and figure out the answer. Not to start with the answer because you did a lot of research, but really to sort out what it is you're thinking, what you're looking at, what everything, whether it's research or experiences or feelings, what they all mean. Now, I wanted to talk about Callie Linfor's Joyous Survival. Um, last fall, in fall 2020, I asked my students to write, um, my 200 level students to write a literacy narrative, and they used Kelly Linfor as their, um, as their starting text, because this is a literacy narrative. And she came in to my class and presented how she brainstormed. And so rather than ask her to do that again, I'm just going to present her presentation and hopefully it will make sense to you. So um, this was her process. Now, I know Kelly pretty well. She's a good friend of mine. Um, when we are in the building um, at SDSU, she's right across the hallway with me. So it's kind of like we share an office and um, we often get in trouble for making too much noise, which is not my fault, I'm just gonna say. Um, but Callie is so much fun, she makes us all laugh. So anyways, here's her process. And it's gonna feel like it's all over the place. But remember, with a personal essay, this is not a straightforward process. This is really thinking. And if you're thinking about things, you've got so many ideas and they're not always in words. Sometimes they're just in unnamed gut feelings and images and memories. And so her process is sorting them all out, scribbling them on a piece of paper, taking notes, 
and then just, and then asking new questions. So her starting point is an inquiry question and you should have an inquiry question. And it isn't a straightforward yes or no, like should I learn to read? It's what does literacy mean to me? If you think about Jessica Harris, it's like, how do the food and the people of my childhood shape the way I am today? Or David Sedaris, um, he asks, um, I don't know what he asks. Is it you know, like, what leads to success? Or what are the most important things? Or what does my family mean to me? And whatever the question is, he's all over the place. And then he comes back right here and he finds the answer. So start with a question. It's an open-ended question that allows you to brainstorm. Don't start with an answer like, does birth order affect my life? Um, and then you find a lot of research that says it does. No, it's just like, how did being the middle child form my image of myself? By the way, I'm an oldest child. Very happy to be an oldest child. So start with the inquiry question and not a straightforward answer. Do some research. What are experts saying? What are some details related to your life? Think in images, write down details, describe the people, places, and things that you're thinking of. So if you were asking that question, how does being, let's put it on me, how does being an oldest child shape the way I view the world? And I'd have to think, I'd have to describe my sister who's two years younger than me and the way people responded to her and what they expected from me. Or the time I accidentally dropped my brother and made his face bleed, but I was only nine and I was struggling to be in charge. But describe the people, places, and things, where you are, the people you meet, the places, the things that were part of that. Dress in, discuss internal, external realities. Create characters. If I'm writing about myself, I need to be a character because people have to see me. This is the identity you're constructing. And as you ask these questions, as you write things down, let yourself ask new questions related to the, those. Understand which parts of your identity matter. Include surprising context. Counter audience assumptions. Certainly, when Callie Linfor writes um, about literacy for her audience of writing teachers, she's pushing them to think beyond the standard ideas of literacy and into the value of multiliteracy that celebrates who students are when they walk into the classroom. Whereas some teachers, particularly in 2002, might have said, we need our students to think a certain way. So, so be willing to just brainstorm and let each idea that you brainstorm sends you in some new little rabbit hole. And this can be uncomfortable, but remember, in the beginning I said, let yourself be uncomfortable. Because when you're learning a new genre, it just is uncomfortable. So this is her process, her inquiry question. You've got to have this. What does literacy mean to me? And so if you're asking these questions, you're going to find some obvious answers. And she came up with reading, access to information, a knowledge of a world beyond myself. Those are the obvious answers, but they're not really interesting. They don't tell a story. Those are the answers everybody thinks of. And so Callie needs to move beyond that. And she asks, 
what else does literacy mean to me? It's the power to control ideas. If you can write, you can control ideas. It's learning and it's listening. And she asks again, let me go deeper. What does literacy mean to me? It's watching other people, situations. It's storytelling. And then she added another one, one that was a little less, well, none of these are obvious, surrendering and recovering. And then new questions arose. When did my literacy form? What did I read? What stories was I told? What did I watch and what did I listen to? And so she's asking these questions in response to the other questions. And so then she started to ask, answer them. And these are those who, what, when, where, why questions. So when did my literacy form? Um, she answered the question I, that she couldn't read and she could barely write and she went until she was in late third grade. Even then she had to learn to memorize words as pictures. So she'd see the word cat and she would picture a cat or a dog or a lion or a light bulb. Um, Callie had dyslexia, and so she had to memorize the words, the letters, as some kind of picture. And then she wrote down, what did I read? Um, she read Swiss Family Robinson, Hatchet, Baby Island, Island of the Blue Dolphins. And if you think about all these stories, they're stories about people, children, who needed to do extraordinary things to survive. And she um, started asking other questions. What do these books have in common? Feral Children, Survival Stories, Independence, Agency. And she read a lot of nonfiction books. Yes, Edible Wild Plants. And she asked herself, why was I so fascinated with these themes, these themes of survival, of agency, of taking control, of, yeah, why? And so she kept asking these questions. And so she asked herself, what stories was I told and how was I told stories? So obviously television, she watched The Muppet Show, Charlie's Angels, what's happening, but she also had a mom and a grandmother who were storytellers. And her grandmother told her about traveling from Oklahoma west by hitching a ride on a train. This is during the Great Depression. And um, yeah. And her mother was sort of a hippie and um, told her a lot of stories about that, but she was an independent woman and um, both of them were abused. And they told Callie those stories. Um, they were all victims of domestic violence and, um, and yet they survived and they survived joyously. And it, I mean, it's messed up and yet this is, this is the backdrop, this is the context in which those stories were told. And she asked herself, why was I so fascinated with these themes of survival? And then she went back to her question, what does literacy mean to me? And remember all the books she was reading and the stories she was being told. Everything circled around surviving. Now, 
She also started thinking about what were the settings that mattered to my literacy. Remember, this was another question. Um, she told me that this picture of the pink carpet and the wallpaper looks just like the house that she grew up in. She says, like, she says, I found this picture and it was so strange. But classrooms, the college, the community college where she went to in Riverside. And she asked who mattered to my liber literacy, her mom, her grandmother, the school librarian, the city librarian, and her first college writing teacher. Who happened to be the last victim of the Hillside Strangler? And then she remembered that the first time she learned about the Hillside Strangler was on television. And she would always watch the news and that was part of the news when she was a very small child, five until the Stranglers were caught. Um, so she didn't start out thinking about the Hillside Strangler. She just started with the question and eventually that's where she ended up. But she holds that in her mind because she's going to write this and who knows which parts of the story are the parts she needs. But she does need to think about who is she writing to because audience matters. You've got to connect with an audience and you have to think. In particular, Callie's writing about multiliteracy, not the standard literacies. She's got to persuade San Diego County writing teachers that this matters. And so she's got to think, how do I connect with them? She's got to think, what does my audience think and believe about my topic? And they probably think literacy is all about identifying, understanding, interpreting, creating, communicating, using printed and written materials. And she wants it to mean more than that, which, by the way, most people agree that it does now, but in 2002, not so much. And so she thinks, what, how does what I think about literacy differ from what my audience thinks? She thinks literacy is survival. It definitely was survival for her. You've read her story. And she thinks all literacies count. Now, how is she going to get her audience, those teachers, to make sense for them? She's got to ask, what parts of my identity matter to this essay? Um, she was poor. This is a picture of the public housing where she grew up. She's dyslexic. She is a queer woman. And so all of these things are part of who she is. But more important, what parts of her identity matter to this audience? Because remember, her goal is to persuade them. Well, she's a poet and she's a writing teacher. So how could she weave in these parts of her identity in a way that matters to her audience. And do you see this process starting with an inquiry question, making connections, researching details, thinking in images? By the way, those details, she had to think. She didn't remember everything exactly. And so she had to find those details. Some of that is in research. Remember, she's five when she first hears about the Hillside Strangler. She wasn't taking notes. Do you remember what happened when you were five exactly? I do not. So she's got to think, what do I remember about this time? And what can I do to reimagine my life at that time? So it's this compilation, conglomeration of memories. got to get the details right. She's got to reimagine. 
So it's remembering and imagining simultaneously. By the way, that is Callie. That's a school picture. Um, when I started using her text, she goes, oh, look, I found a picture of myself. So um, she had to add data and sources. Now, hopefully you already have a topic. As you begin drafting this, you've got your mentor text in one area and you've got to brainstorm and think and discover what it is you really think, why you think that way. And then you've got to start telling stories till you find the answers and then tell them in a way that matters to your audience. That's all I've got. I know this is hard. This is a hard assignment, but an assignment that allows you to say things that matter. You read the student examples from my spring class. And I'm gonna tell you, I read all kinds of extraordinary essays, essays that could be published from students who didn't necessarily see themselves as writers, but who had important questions to ask and important ways to think about them. And I think that you do too. And so I'm out. Have a great rest of your day. And I look forward to reading first draft.